of 346. I uh, figured we'd have a little chat about uh, the first one here. Uh, again, going to try to do this a number of different ways this semester in terms of in person or on site and versus online. So I'm probably going to try to tape a lot of these and have these up as well, depending on how you want to access the course this semester. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is just the idea of ad adaptation. Uh, and get into what this course is really looking at throughout a lot of this. Uh, again, really what we're doing here is trying to do, to me it's kind of an advanced physiology course looking at the way the body deals with different stressors that are put on it. Uh, so a lot of times we can talk about this being adaptation, this idea that the body or something is going to respond to something put on it. So Again, adaptations are not only what we're going to be talking about in this class. There is a number of different types of adaptations. You can have things that are structural adaptations. So a change in structure or the look of that particular organism. This can be not within one animal, but over generations. Uh, you can talk about behavioral changes, how an animal might respond to a particular stressor by its behavior, by changing its behavior, for example. Uh, what we're really going to be looking at in this course is a lot more of these physiological adaptations, the ones that the actual functioning of the organism is going to change to let it better deal with its environment. So again, structural adaptations are just change in shape, structure, look of that particular organism to help it respond to its environment. Uh, things like the camel and the ability of it to store nutrients in that fat in its hump to allow it to go a long time without needing a number of nutrients as well as being very water efficient in terms of and it's more of a physiological one but you get the example there cactuses and how their structure to allow them to survive in the environments that they are as well as the structure that protects them from other organisms such as the spines on them uh, behavioral adaptations again are going to be these behavior changes taken on by an organism to help it survive in an environment. Uh, some examples of this, uh, plants and how they will grow towards light in a particular environment to allow them to be able to function better in that environment with that light source. Uh, for example, emperor penguins during the cold times of the year, uh, the males, what they will do is actually group together to increase the warmth so they don't freeze to death. Uh, as well as other animals when it's hotter to preserve energy will, like a cat, loaf around or like my dog who is in her kennel right now will loaf around if they're not getting as much nutrients coming in to kind of conserve those nutrients and uh, save them for when they need them. Again, what we're really going to worry about here a lot more and especially we're going to look at this in humans is we're going to look at physiological adaptations. So features, like it says here, of an organism changes in the normal physiology, for example. So uh, that let it better survive in the environment. So how we are handling water in terms of hot environments, for example. Uh, how the heart is functioning after being exposed to temperature or being exposed to exercise. How is a person going to deal with that? Uh, I mean, other examples... Uh, certain mangroves can grow in these saltwater environments based on how they can interact and kind of allow them to take in the water without being poisoned by the salt. Uh, we could use the same thing talking about kind of some of those adaptations in uh, sea creatures. Uh, for example, like bull sharks they have the ability with their kidneys to function in both salt water as well as fresh water up to a point. So that would be another example of a physiologic adaptation. Uh, kangaroo mice and their ability to really uh, use very minimal water to be able to excrete their waste products, make an incredibly concentrated urine to deal with that uh, lack of water in their environment. So again, physiologic adaptations, as again the course is human physiological adaptation, that's what we're really looking at here, these physiologic adaptations. So the changes in physiology and how those are going to work to help humans better deal with their environment or stressors put on them. And in reality, that's really what I wanted to build this around is the idea of the human physiology response to stressors. So something that is acting on the body, possibly trying to take it out of its kind of happy place and how the body kind of deals with that in order to 
either in the short term or in a little bit longer term to better be able to deal with that stress. So again, this goes back to this idea of homeostasis. So everybody in this course has taken uh, anatomy and physiology at some point. And if you had it with me, one of the things I talked about over and over again was the, the key concept of homeostasis. This idea that maintaining a somewhat unstable internal environment, even though the external environment may be changing. So body temperature, for instance, have a set range that we try to keep it within. And if it's 10 degrees out or 100 degrees out, we're doing different mechanisms to try to keep it within that range. Uh, again, this is really key to the body. And again, that idea of maintenance of constant internal environment or stable internal environment despite changing external environment. And really, homeostasis is this key idea even in this course. Again, we're talking about different structures, but you have an organism, it's, you might get an internal change or external change, leads to some loss of homeostasis. And really what generally is always going to happen is it, it, going out of that particular set range and we've lost this homeostasis, what's going to happen is the organism or that body, or if we're talking humans, the human body is going to try to compensate for this. And really one of two things can happen. Compensation can succeed and that organism is maintained and it continues to function well. Or if we lose the ability to compensate, that is going to be either an illness or a disease or take it out far enough, as we always joked around in A&P, and then you die is what you can always kind of get to at some point or another if it goes far enough down that path. So again, what we're looking at here is a lot of how if we put a particular stressor on the body, how is it going to attempt to compensate and what does that look like physiologically? So again, so many of these different things that we have to keep it within range. Uh, again, if a and P, when you went through that, I mean, it's thousands of things in reality. So things like metabolites, ions, temperature. Temperature is one of the things we will focus on a little bit more deeply at some point during the semester here. These different gases, which we'll also hit on when we talk about altitude adaptations. But again, waste products, blood pressure, all these things. We have all these particular variables that we need to keep in that particular happy place. And again, there's usually some type of negative feedback loop that is working to try to bring it back into that range. And again, it's either something comes out of homeostasis, the body's able to compensate for it and maintain normal functioning, or it's unable to compensate for it and we have an issue. And it really goes back to this whole idea of a stimulus response model. They're basically a feedback loop. You get some type of stimulus, it acts on a receptor, the receptor takes that information up to a particular region in the body. In most cases, this is going to be the brain or the brain stem. Uh, the control center there takes a look at that one. It has the British spelling on there, sorry. Stole this from someplace else. But uh, then we send that information if we need to make a change out to an effector and it leads to a response that ideally will change the variable. And then when the stimulus goes to read this again, it might be within the range, the control center looks at it, and we no longer have to send a response out. We've brought it back into homeostasis. And again, this is a lot of times negative feedback loops. We talked about this in my this semester here. I'll be talking about with my AMP students again about this idea of negative feedback loops and why they're so common in the body. But the example here, blood CO2 goes up. Uh, receptors in the arteries and veins and in the brain and cerebrospinal fluid recognize this. They send this information to the respiratory center in the brain stem. It looks at this, compares it with the normal set point. It's out of that normal set point, sends a message to those effectors, those respiratory muscles in the lungs, says to breathe more often, breathe quicker. We are going to exhale more CO2. That leads to a decrease in blood CO2 levels, which sooner or later will stop that respiratory center from sending that response out and we stop that whole response cycle here. So again, just the way the particular variable goes out, how we bring it back in with one of these negative feedback loops. And again, this is a number of different systems that are dealing with this. And this is part of the reason that this is required before this course, because one of the things that we are gonna talk about a decent amount is how the circulatory system responds to stressors, how the respiratory system responds to stressors. Uh, will involve the integumentary system and some of these other ones as well.
So one of the things I'm doing in this course is I end up really tailoring it around the idea of endurance exercise. A uh, number of different reasons for that. Uh, one of them is, is I like this stuff. <laughs> if I'm being entirely honest, this is stuff uh, for about the last 12 years I've really been into running uh, and the physiological changes that go with that has always kind of been one of the things I geek out on a little bit. So to me this was taking something that I've already was teaching which was anatomy and physiology and kind of taking it that next step and doing it with one of my personal things that I really kind of enjoy which is endurance exercise. But that's part of the reason for the course which is not one of the bullet points I would put on there. But why I actually use this, one of the main reasons is, is it's something that we can do within a semester that really lets us see some of these changes that we talk about. And a lot of times when we talk about something on the body, it, it's not like changes in muscle or bone density. Yeah, these are things that change, but they're not observable to us. Uh, I mean, at least not non-invasively. I mean, we could say, yeah, if you do this and lift these weights, your bones are going to get increased density in them and we could observe this. But we would have to do a bone biopsy and actually look at that. Or lifting weights, it leads to changes in the muscle mass and the actual muscle fibers. That would be observable. You might be able to see an increase in muscle size or an increase in the ability to lift weight, but we can't look specifically at the muscles. With endurance exercise, because what's going on here, we can look at heart rate changes. We can look at breathing rate changes. These are all things that are relatively non-invasive things. So the first thing is here, we can see the changes that happen on this one. And that's part of the reason I picked this one here. And we can see them in, for the most part, non-invasive measures. Some of the things that I would normally try to do in this class, we are gonna have to modify this semester. Uh, a lot of times we would do testing on the treadmill and do some of the things like that. It's not possible this semester. That requires putting a mask on somebody and doing it on different people and we're not going to take the risks with uh, COVID-19 and what's going on here now to do some of the measurements that we would normally do. That being said, we can still do some of those things that I would have you do, but we can do it more kind of out on a track or other stuff like that. We're not going to actually be able to get the actual numbers. But we could do some other things looking at heart rates and breathing rate changes, heart rate recovery, and some of these other things, which we can't look at exactly what we might look at normally. But again, all these measurements that we will be doing can be relatively non-invasive. They don't require us to take a sample out of you. They don't require us to do a muscle biopsy or a bone biopsy. It's really looking at heart rate, looking at breathing rates, and things along those lines, which are non-invasive. The other thing with this one is at least some of the earlier adaptations we can get to endurance exercise, they happen within the time frame that we have to work with. Uh, certain adaptations, if we're going to look at this stuff, sometimes would take six, eight months. That's not something that's doable in a semester program or a semester course here. Some of the changes we see with this happened in about six to eight weeks and by the time we start some of this stuff and if I have each of you try to do a little training program or something else like that you can actually see those changes happen so it's really the fact that it was something that I've always found interesting along with these ideas that made me kind of try to tailor this course and use this as a way to look at how stressors alter or cause changes in the physiology of the body and that's why I went with this stuff and to me it's just this is a neat course to me. It's probably one of my favorite ones to talk about. It is interesting. It, it, you get to take this physiology and go to those next couple of steps and really just kind of geek out on the physiology. And we don't have to do all the, here's this bone name or here's this bone name. Bone name. We get to really just kind of go with that physiology and really take it to where it can go. Uh, so that's why we're doing it this way. A lot of what this tailors around in returns to stressor response goes back to what's called uh, the general adaptation syndrome. So this was Hans Selye is the one that kind of came up with this in the 1930s and it was talking about the predictable way that the body actually responds to a stressor that's put on it. He was focused on non-athletic things on this one. Uh, but really a lot of the East Germans, the Russians in the 1960s 
started to really look at this idea of the general adaptation theory as it relates to sports training. Uh, but really it kind of comes down to there is this three stage uh, thing that happens that kind of says this is what the body's going to do when it has a particular stressor. Uh, this also gets into why it's so important, as we'll see in a little bit here, why there needs to be, when you're talking about athletic training, there has to be a recovery period in here because we're going to see when Salia was looking at this stuff, he was looking at more non-athletic stressors. And again, if a stressor stays on you too long, you no longer, you can try to adapt to it for a while, but sooner or later we're going to see that the third stage on this stuff here is a failure state which when you're doing a training type of program or endurance training that's not something you want so you you have to build in that recovery so they don't get to a failure state and again along with this stuff here they were starting to look at how physiologists were starting to really look at how different adaptations can take place due to different training stressors so the Salier's theory really looks at these three stages here. You have the shock phase or the alarm phase, the adaptation or resistance phase where the body's trying to deal with the stressor and change to handle it. Uh, exhaustion phase, at least in terms of athletic training, is what we don't want to get to. This is where it goes into a failure state. Uh, and that's, again, what you're going to try to avoid. So we'll take a look at each of these ones. The alarm stage... You put an initial stressor on somebody. This one, the stress is first recognized. A lot of times there's going to be a fight or flight or a quick response to this. A lot of times I'll talk about this being a, an accommodation type response. The body tries to accommodate the stressor by doing what it can in that actual moment there. And one of the things we do is we start talking about the exercise stressors. And we'll talk about this with a number of stressors. So we're going to talk about exercise stress. We're going to talk about altitude stress, we're going to talk about heat stress, and maybe discuss cold and a few other things. But one of the things I talk about in each of these ones is kind of this short-term or accommodation response, and that's really what this alarm phase is. This is that quick response, almost immediate, that the body kind of goes into a fight or flight, quick action to try to deal with the stress. So something that, okay, all of a sudden it's super hot out or all of a sudden you got really embarrassed, your body tries really quickly, heart rate up, all those fight or flight stuff, deal with that response here. So like it says on the bottom here, the example, nearly miss a serious car accident, all of a sudden we release a bunch of hormones, adrenaline, all the stuff here, increase the heart rate, increase the blood pressure, and then over a period of time as that stress is removed, the body goes back to a normal state. With the resistance stage, if we keep having the stress put upon us, what we're going to see is at this point, the body's going to start making adjustments enzymatically, physiologically, to try to deal with this stress. Like it says, you generally, you need to have some rest take place in here in order to recover and rebuild from those stress being on there. So at least with that athletic training idea, you hit it with a stressor, then you have to give it enough time to recover from that stressor before you can hit it again. Uh, we're going to see as we go through a lot of this here, because of this recovery and the type of things that happen, a lot of times the particular response that the body has is very specific to the stressor that's put up on it. So a lot of times we'll talk about specificity and generally the more specific the stressor, the more specific the response. And if you're trying to get that particular response, you need to be specific on the stressor you put on the body. Uh, like it says here, a speed training session might bring about certain changes in the tissue and bring about the particular changes that are needed where a different stressor is going to bring about a different change. And we'll get into this as we go. Uh, and really the last stage here, and this is what you try to avoid in most stress responses here, is the exhaustion stage. If you have a stress that continues to stay on you, and this might be something that you're just stressed out because of everything that's going on in the world and you have this continuous stress, over a period of time, this can become an issue. I mean, that would be a non-athletic example. But even with athletic examples, if you continue having the stress or you're lifting the same amount of weight every day but not giving that muscle a tough time to recover, you're going and running and doing speed work every day and not letting those muscles recover, over time, the body will run out of the ability to have enough reserve energy to deal with the stress, and sooner or later, it starts affecting normal function and can lead to a loss of homeostasis. Uh, 
and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about this idea of overreaching and overtraining and this idea that you can put too much stress on the body. And again, this is just a nice little summary that kind of talks about those different stages. What's the alarm stage? What's the resistance stage? What's the exhaustion stage? Again, alarm stage, this would be a normal response to a stressor, a quick, fast-acting response, kind of a fight-or-flight idea. Resistance stage is this longer-term kind of body trying to adjust to the stress, become more efficient at dealing with it. And again, this is one of the things I said in my AMP in class a bunch, and I'll say in here a bunch, the body is very good at trying to deal with what stressors you put onto it. It will try to find the most efficient way to manage that stress and deal with it. But again, if you do this for too long, too high a level of stress, body either is going to adapt to it, be able to deal with the stress, or if it's too much or for too long, it will go into an exhaustion stage, which is the inability to deal with that stress. It's a failure stage.